happened before in formulating the path forward for humanity. Today we stand at the brink of a monumental shift in world powers. The West is in decline, its promise of democracy and freedom devoid of substance and the legitimacy of its ruling class questioned by its own people as much as the darker masters of humanity. On the other hand, Asia is rising with China at its helm, presenting the first comprehensive economic and ideological challenge to Western domination since the fall of the Soviet Union. As the two most populous economies of the world, the destinies of India and China are inexorably intertwined and principled unity between them of great significance to this world historic moment. India and China, two of the oldest continuous civilizations in human history, share many commonalities of the human experience. Cultural and economic contact between them goes back thousands of years when the message of the Buddha ushered in a golden age of collaboration and synthesis. Both suffered centuries of subjugation and humiliation at the hands of the West, leading to the complete dismantling of their cultural and economic institutions, widespread poverty, famine, and illiteracy, and the decimation of their societal dignity. Both engaged in a long and arduous struggle to reclaim their freedom and sovereignty and build a strong and resilient state ground up from the ruins of the colonial period. The world significance of the Indian and Chinese struggles cannot be understated. They were mass movements arising out of the peasantry and comprising people of all sections of society who united despite many differences and were transformed through the common struggle for freedom. They provide for our times the example of a leadership that carried the weight on their shoulders of not just a section of society, but a whole nation, and especially the poor and disinherited that compose the majority of the population. These struggles have made a substantial contribution to humanity in terms of methods of resistance against imperialism and war, and the building of a united front of the oppressed all over the world. It was in the forge of the anti-colonial struggle that the ancient bonds of friendship and solidarity between India and China were rekindled. Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian poet and philosopher, embodied this, this reawakening. He strove for cultural and artistic collaboration between India and China with the belief that united, they could lead a resurgent Asia in resisting Western materialism through the moral force of love and spirituality. To him, civilization was dharma or the moral imperative which, quote, binds humanity and leads to the best possible welfare. God himself is bound to his creations through the bond of love, he was to write. And in the interconnectedness of man, he perceived true freedom. Rejecting narrow nationalism, he embraced humanism, saying, quote, patriotism cannot be our final spiritual sh shelter. My refuge is humanity, end quote. He built the China Bhavan at Vishwabharati University as an enduring symbol of friendship and brotherhood between the two countries. The Indian and Chinese states came into being within a year of each other. In their conception and vision for the future, they were shaped by the continuity of their civilizational histories. These two great countries of Asia were part of an ancient civilizational complex that extended all the way from Egypt to China. Their shared traditions in art and literature are evidence that the cultural links between them, although forged by Buddhism, were not merely limited to religion. For thousands of years in antiquity, the Indian and Chinese people coexisted without conflict as equal friends committed to peace and to a deep study of the human condition. Our civilizations have a long and rich tradition of synthesis of alternative worldviews and philosophies, always firmly rooted in universal truth. It is not surprising that while India and China adopted different political ideologies based on their objective conditions, their concept of statehood had commonalities that reflect this civilizational insight. The Indian and Chinese states emphasized peaceful coexistence and cooperation as the only path forward in a post-colonial world. While the West sought to impose uniformity by force, India and China advocate, 
advocated mutual respect and tolerance for different political and economic systems and the right of each nation to self-determination. The Indian and Chinese states built on the sacrifice and principled struggle of their people against foreign domination need to be defended at all costs. Despite the fact that we have attained political independence, the West, through increasingly sophisticated forces of ideological control, neocolonialism and war, continues to threaten our sovereignty and right to self-determination. In a desperate attempt to maintain the status quo, they sow seeds of discord in Asia. We must refuse to let the narrative of India-China relations be dominated by accounts of recent and aberrant conflict and recognize that the Indian and Chinese people are bound by the common humanity of their civilizational histories, a bond that is older and stronger than nationalism. Together, India and China account for a third of humanity and also, importantly, a third of the world's youth on whom rests the future of mankind. Their boundless energy and untried potential of these millions of young minds can breathe new life and vigor into the great work of building a more just world. It is the work of our times to harness this vast human potential to perform the tasks so sorely needed by humanity, to build a new revolutionary framework of artistic expression and scientific endeavor. Now is the time for us to turn to a deep and conscientious study of our common struggle for freedom and reinterpret for our moment its revolutionary legacy. Now is the time for us to take a moral stand without fear or hesitation on what path humanity should follow in order to deliver the broadest measure of justice and freedom to all. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., quote, we are now faced with the fact that today is tomorrow. Tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. It is in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action." End quote. It is in the interest of formulating positive action and learning from the example of the Indian and Chinese struggles that we meet today for the following panel titled, India and China, distinct but parallel struggles for the liberation of dark humanity. We will first listen to the presentation of our three panelists in the order uh, Archishman Raju, Meghna Chandra and Ram Mohan Rai. And after that, I'll open the floor for discussion. At this point, uh, uh, the participants on Zoom can raise their hands and I'll call on them. I'll also take comments from the Facebook live stream um, and address them to the panelists. So our first panelist is Archishman Raju, who is a researcher at NCBS Bangalore. And his presentation is titled, India and China as part of the world revolution. Raju, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Purba. And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to mention again that uh, uh, we are doing this event, you know, as part of the centenary of the Communist Party of China to commemorate it uh, to begin with. But it is also, you know, the end of the centenary of the non-cooperation movement in India, uh, which in a sense marked uh, the beginning of the freedom struggle in India, at least in its modern form. Um, you know, even though, of course, it was building on uh, previous experiences. Uh, but uh, so I think today, a hundred years after these struggles, um, uh, it's we are at a time when we can look at the commonalities between the Indian anti-colonial struggle and the Chinese revolution. And I want to do that today as part of this broader um, idea to try and see the commonalities between India and China. Um, and of course, both of our, both of these nations have been shaped uh, to a huge extent uh, by the struggles which led to the establishment of their independent state. And so it's important to look at these struggles. Uh, and since uh, we are doing this event for peace between India and China, I think it's important to examine the commonalities between these struggles. Uh, but also before I begin my presentation, I wanted to say that we are doing this event in an atmosphere when the system of um, global uh, capitalism is in a deep political and economic crisis. Um, and I think the signs of this are everywhere. 
uh, you know, some people look at the inequality levels, which are higher than ever before, uh, high levels of unemployment and discontent around the world, uh, especially with the policies of what was called globalization or neoliberal capitalism. And, uh, you know, we are facing the possibility of hyperinflation in the United States right now, uh, whose effects will be felt all over the world. Um, and so we are really doing this event, I think, at a time when, uh, which is a moment of crisis. And uh, alongside that, I think it's also a time when there has been an intense ideological attack on all revolutionary ideas. Uh, the atmosphere in which we are operating, I think, first of all, has this continued anti-communism, uh, which has been propagated by the Western ruling elite in particular, uh, but alongside their cronies around, along, you know, in the world. Um, but on the other hand, I think there have been several ideological attacks that have developed on all struggles for freedom in general, and the Indian freedom struggle in particular. And these ideological attacks base themselves ideologically on uh, different things on postmodernism, identity politics, ultra leftism, uh, or reactionary cultural nationalism. And I think this has led to an atmosphere where it is very hard to objectively examine these past struggles and learn from them in our time. Uh, and yet, I think these struggles are constitute, they represent the gold standard of what struggle looks like. Um, and a generation of youth, which I think Purba mentioned, uh, many of whom are turning pessimistic, I think need to study them to find moral, political, and even spiritual direction for our time. I think that is what makes it important to look back at these struggles, to defend them and to understand them. Now on the surface, these two struggles look very distinct. The Chinese struggle uh, involved a bitter civil war, whereas India saw a non-violent mass struggle. You know, Mao was famous for saying that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. But as Gandhi would say, nonviolence is the greatest force at the disposal of mankind. The distinctions between these two struggles are obvious on the surface, and I think have been spoken about several times. Uh, but as Lenin said, quote, history as a whole and the history of revolutions in particular is always richer in content, more varied, more multiform, more lively and ingenious than is imagined by even the best parties, the most class conscious vanguards of the most advanced classes. This can readily be understood because even the finest of vanguards express the class consciousness, will, passion and imagination of tens of thousands. Whereas at moments of great upsurge and the exertion of all human capacities, revolutions are made by the class consciousness, will, passion and imagination of tens of millions spurred on by a most acute struggle of classes. Uh, and I think this scene in their depth and in essence, therefore, um, there are several parallels and commonalities between the Indian and Chinese struggle, which becomes clear once one sees them not as isolated historical occurrences, but in the context of a world revolution. The world system of imperialism had inevitably linked all colonized and semi-colonized countries together. It had broken down their society and natural evolution. It had created extremely oppressive conditions for the masses of people in these nations. Foreign-made machine goods severely decimated the livelihoods of Indian and Chinese artisans. Foreign powers led to the deindustrialization of Indian and Chinese society, creating vast famines, which led to the deaths of several millions of people in both of these societies. Hence, I think it is no coincidence that to begin with, uh, the Taiping Rebellion, which the Chinese you know, communist leaders used to call the Taiping Revolution, uh, and in India, 1857, the first war of independence took place within a space of 10 years of each other. Uh, and both of these movements were uh, brutally crushed eventually by foreign powers, the British in India and, you know, the British, but also, also in China. But in their own way, I think the Indian freedom fighters and the Chinese revolutionaries learned from these past experiences in the 19th, mid 19th century. The Chinese revolutionary closely studied the Taiping revolution. They studied how the Taiping leader Shi Dakai's military retreat was cut off at the Dadu River and made sure not to repeat his mistake. The Indian struggle in turn was propelled by the suppression of the 1857 struggle on one hand and the failure of constitutional methods being tried by others on the other hand to adopt a radically different approach of non-violent direct action. I think after the French and Russian revolutions, the Chinese revolution and the Indian freedom struggle deserve foremost importance in world history 
for they both conducted historical struggles against world imperialism and in the process deepened our understanding of what constitutes revolution they have importance not only for the countries of which they were a part of but i think they have world historic importance and there is a question of what language should be used to describe these struggles uh, and in fact in the 1930s both mao and nehru were referring to the aims of the chinese and the indian struggles respectively as bourgeois democratic however it became clear that these struggles had nothing in common with the western bourgeoisie of the 20th century but instead had become part of the world socialist movement for democracy and were fundamentally anti imperialist in nature sometimes they were called a new type of bourgeois democratic movement i prefer lenin's language of national revolutionary struggles for i think they were both indeed revolutionary struggles i would also suggest that their theoretical understanding and conceptualization also needs the language and work of the great theorist w e b du bois who came up with this idea of the darker nations i think who was mentioning and the color line uh, but let me just uh, move on to speaking about the two leaders of these two struggles because i think in their life and comparison a lot comes out um, you know and so i'm talking about mao zedong and mahatma gandhi and the relationship between the leader and the struggle is always a multifaceted and dialectical one and i think mao and gandhi were both not just great revolutionaries but were also great theorists who both discovered the revolutionary essence of how struggle could be conducted in the chinese and indian context in their time to call mao a revolutionary is not controversial but when you use that word for gandhi it doesn't always you know sit well with some people uh, but i think uh, that word has to be used because he was the undisputed leader of a freedom struggle and was chosen by the masses of indian people and because he understood the masses and was able to move them to a higher stage of struggle back you know to go a little gandhi was the older of the two uh, he was born in porbandar his father was uh, i guess what you call a chief minister um uh, he was you know of the generation of sun yat sen the great democratic leader of the chinese people after his education in london uh, when gandhi came to south africa in 1893 he was a young barrister looking to make his career in law when he returned back to india in 1915 he traveled in the lowest class of the ship to understand the transformation that took place for him one has to study his connection to the indian population in south africa south africa was full of indentured indian labor brought there as a way to drive down african wages and prevent any unity of labor it should be remembered that after the british abolished slavery in 1833 they often relied on asian indentured labor across the you know atlantic for works and plantations millions of indians and chinese were taken as indentured labor to africa caribbean and latin america this indentured labor was used by the british throughout the world uh, in conditions uh, you know in um, terribly oppressive conditions and it was this labor that in fact deeply inspired gandhi in south africa and there are many examples of this uh, but just to take one quote of his from that time he says in the van of the satyagraha battle where indians born here were indians born here and among them particularly the poor and the simple people rendered great services the rich were busy getting richer in stock mode south africa but around the time gandhi was leading his satyagraha in south africa ma was about 14 years old and he was working on his family's farm he was born to given the conditions of china a relatively well off peasant family in hunan um and uh, you know in this time 1905 both india and china were deeply affected by japan's victory against russia uh in the war in 1905 in fact bal gangadhar tilak had wrote about japan's victory and how it had been a blow to european arrogance about asian inferiority similarly china saw the coming to the fore of intellectuals and reformers like kang yu wei and liang qi chao who mao said he would read obsessively so the early 20th century saw the parallel intellectual ferment in asia as ideas of independence reform modernization and anti imperialism arose hence in the 1910s Mao was convinced of the need to modernize and educate the Chinese people. By this time, Gandhi had returned. You know, who at that time he saw uh, that the Chinese, the condition of the Chinese people was backward, and they needed to be modernized and to educate it. And at this time, Gandhi had returned back to India, and he had fashioned his weapon of satyagraha, but he had not yet directly opposed the British Empire. The First World War and the Russian Revolution were, of course, world historic events which accelerated the development of events in India and China. 
by 1918, Mao had formed the New People's Study School and was exposed to the ideas of the Russian Revolution. In 1919, the famous May 4th movement happened in China, a movement of primarily students who were demonstrating against imperialism and the unfair treaties imposed in China after the conclusion of the war. In India, uh, at this time, Gandhi had tied the non-cooperation movement um, and he was tying it with the Khilafat movement and had started openly, you know, around this time, opposing the British Empire. So the intellectual ideas that had developed in 1905 were finding ferment in the new world conditions. And at this point, Mao writing the editorial for the, you know, a journal, Xiang River Review, he wrote of the need to fight oppression, to unite the masses. Though at this point, Mao considered boycotts and strikes as the main weapon to be used in the struggle considering violence, in fact, to be a tool of oppression, uh, which I'll, I'll come back to this question of violence. So in Champaran and the Kheda Satyagraha of 1917-1918, Gandhi had already made his turn to the masses of people and to the peasantry in particular. As he said in Champaran, quote, in meeting with the peasants, I was face to face with God, Ahimsa and truth. Gandhi soon became the undisputed leader of the Indian freedom struggle. For Mao, the turn to the peasantry came in his study of the peasant struggle of Hunan in 1927, when he detailed in his, you know, in his report an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan. And Mao then took a definitive turn towards the peasantry as the vanguard of the Chinese revolution. He made a detailed examination of the peasant rebellions and peasant committees in four different provinces in Hunan and defended their activities against the oppressive landlords in Chinese society. Both Mao and Gandhi turned away from the intellectual movements before them and based themselves firmly in the peasantry, in the seemingly most backward section of society. In his defense of the great masses of poor peasants and their struggle, Mao turned the ideological direction of the communist movement. Mao and Gandhi both based themselves completely among the Indian poor. As Subhash Chandra Bose, for example, said of Gandhi, quote, wherever he may go, even the poorest of the poor feels that he is a product of the Indian soil bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, end quote. The same, of course, can be said of Mao, who in all essence came from the Chinese peasantry. Mao's report on the peasantry was written a month before Chiang Kai Shek, uh, who had taken over the Kuomintang in China after the death of Sun Yat-sen. He began the Shanghai massacre, in which going against the wishes of Sun Yat-sen, who had wanted the nationalists and communists to unite, he initiated a violent campaign against the communists. This changed the course of the Chinese revolution. Combined with the warlordism that was present in Chinese society at that time, it turned it into an extremely violent civil war, an anti-imperialist war that continued for more than 20 years. This betrayal and warlordism had no parallel in Indian history. A big part of that war was the Long March, which was initiated as a strategic retreat of the Red Army from their base in Jiangxi. The Long March is unique and without parallel. With bare minimum equipment through difficult terrain, the Red Army covered close to 8,000 miles on foot. They did all of this while being pursued by a much better armed and stocked army of Chiang Kai Shek. Through the long march, the Red Army showed incredible courage, covering an average of 25 miles a day. To take one example, the Red Army commander Liu Po Cheng had to go through the Lolo tribal territory. To negotiate passage through the territory, Liu drank the blood of a newly killed chicken, along with the high chieftain of the Lolo to seal the political alliance between the Red Army and the Lolos. When crossing the Dadu River, the Red Army asked for volunteers who would cross the bridge and walk in the face of enemy machine guns to certain death just to make passage for their comrades behind them. In the process, they forged some of the hardest revolutionaries and most courageous people the world has known, and also initiated a campaign of political education across all provinces that they covered. The Long March is the time in which Mao solidified his leadership of the Communist Party of China. And there's now a 10 part series documentary of the Long March taken out by CGTN, uh, which I think, which I'll encourage everyone to watch. In a different way, Gandhi's campaign of nonviolent resistance was equally unique. It developed the practical application and social struggle of the concepts of truth and nonviolence for our time. The concept of nonviolence led to intense debate among revolutionaries. I think it is often misunderstood as a tactic or a strategy, but it was a philosophy. I think it went much deeper than that. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., nonviolence was an expression of the fact that we are all tied in a single garment of destiny. Nonviolence is often confused with non resistance or with weakness. To the contrary, Gandhi imagined it as immense fearlessness, freedom from all external fear. Hence, along with Ahimsa, he spoke of Abhay, 
of fearlessness. He said that he preferred violence to cowardice. Gandhi thought of the nonviolent struggle as a war of its own type, a war for truth and freedom. Thus, our nonviolent campaign also developed people of extreme fearlessness, where people were willing to walk in the face of bullets and bayonets. As the American journalist Webb Miller, who had covered World War I, said of the uh, uh, Dandi March, when he saw the Satyagrahis being beaten uh, and not responding with either fear or violence, he said, quote, in 18 years of reporting in 22 countries, during which I have witnessed innumerable civil disturbances, riots, and rebellions, I have never witnessed such harrowing scenes. What created such disciplined and courageous people? I think it was the expression of indomitable will, which came because of the level of political education of our people at that time. I think there were many aspects of the thought of Mao and Gandhi that united them. Both did not just take their ideas to the people, but they believed that ordinary and poor people were capable of producing ideas, producing knowledge. Mao himself had been insulted and ignored by intellectuals when he was an assistant librarian at a young age. As he said in 1942 of these ruthless intellectuals, quote, they ought to be aware of the truth that actually many so-called intellectuals are, relatively speaking, most ignorant, and the workers and peasants sometimes know more than they do. Gandhi similarly said that the, quote, concentrated essence of wisdom was to be found in the poorest of the poor and not among the intellectuals in the cities of India who looked up to the British. Both asked for fearlessness, sacrifice, and humility from their followers, and for intellectuals that were dedicated to the service of the struggle. Through Gandhi's constructive program, he worked out the need for service to the masses. Similarly, Mao would say, be concerned with the well-being of the masses, and speak how the Communist Party must seek to be the vanguard of the masses as a whole. Both Mao and Gandhi emphasized the importance of practice. Both did not consider abstract ideas and theory to have any relevance unless they could work, be worked out in practice. I think the point about practice is very important because a lot of people have criticisms of our freedom struggle or of Mao's revolution. For example, a lot of people say that, you know, Gandhi during the freedom struggle didn't go far enough. Or, you know, some people say Mao went too far during his struggle. But um, I'm talking about the revolutionary struggle, you know, till 1949. Uh, these criticisms, I think, must be judged by the effectiveness of the ideological positions of the critics in practice. Were these positions in practice able to unite the masses of people against imperialism? It is not enough to point to a few isolated rebellions as evidence of radicalism. We must discriminate between revolution and rebellion. A revolution must be capable of taking an entire society to a higher stage of development. This was Gandhi and Mao's great achievement, to achieve unity among the people and by declaring a free India and a People's Republic of China to take their people to a different stage of history. In the final analysis, Mao was a genius who worked out the Chinese essence of revolution and in the process enhanced revolutionary theory and practice. Similarly, Gandhi worked out the essence on the lines in which the struggle in India was to be conducted and in the process offered the world a whole new philosophy of social change. In remembering these two struggles, we, two figures and these two struggles, we seek to remember the values they exemplified and seek their relevance for our time. In studying their lives, we should hope to teach the young generation what they stood for and why their selfless contributions to struggle are to be remembered. In emphasizing the life and ideas of the two, one is not simply emphasizing them as individuals, but as leadership that captured the dreams, aspirations, and movements of two countries in their struggle against imperialism. In pointing out the parallels between the two struggles and how they were a part of world revolution, one is seeking to learn from the best of revolutionary traditions. Finally, while the distinction between the two struggles may have appeared sharp at one point, I think one should remember that the trajectories of our two nations are deeply connected and it is only in friendship and understanding that we can progress and fulfill the ideals of those struggles today. Thanks. Thanks, Archishman, for that very clarifying presentation on the commonalities of the two struggles and their leadership and also their significance for the for world revolution. Our next panelist is Meghna Chandra, who is a graduate student at the University of Philadelphia. And her presentation is titled Against the Propaganda of History, the Indian and Chinese States and the Long Struggle for Reconstruction. Go ahead, Meghna. Sure. Uh, thank you, Purva. Thank you, uh, Nanta and Raju, for organizing this very timely and uh, courageous conference. Um, so I wanted to begin with a phrase coined by the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, the propaganda of history. 
Du Bois used this term to understand what white historians wrote about the period after the Civil War, uh, from 18, roughly 1860 to 1880, known as Reconstruction. During this time, Black men wielded political power in the American South. Black statesmen reformed the tax code along progressive lines, redistributed the land of the slave masters, founded universal public education, and transformed planter oligarchies into modern states. They were forced out of power in 1877 when industrial capital in the North reconciled with the agrarian South in order to reap profits off of cheap cotton and black labor. They left the, the South to the hands of white terrorists. They concentrated power in the hands of a wealthy minority, destroying democracy for a century. Despite the undeniable achievements of these freedmen, white historians wrote of reconstruction as nothing but the collapse of civilization. They wrote of black people as ignorant, lazy, dishonest, and extravagant. All that went wrong during reconstruction was the fault of black men because they were inherently incapable of ruling, let alone taking part in democracy. The chief witness of reconstruction, the emancipated slave himself was barred from the court. Du Bois understand that this propaganda of history served a purpose to justify Jim Crow and the imperialist world system. The aim of the propaganda of history is to disguise doctrines of racial inferiority as scientific analysis. Truly scientific history serves a different purpose. As Du Bois writes, what is the object of writing the history of reconstruction? Is it to wipe out the disgrace of a people who fought to make slaves of Negroes? Is it to show the North that the North had higher motives than freeing black men? Is it to prove that Negroes were angels? No. It is simply as to establish the truth on which right in the future may be built. Du Bois's insight about history has great relevance for our current world situation of a rising Asia, because the propaganda of history is that the nations that freed themselves from colonialism were failures. India is backwards, China is authoritarian, Zimbabwe is corrupt, Russia is oligarchic, and North Korea is a madhouse. Only Western style democracies, structural reform, and alignment with the West on matters of foreign policy can civilize these countries. Analysis shows that neither China nor India have failed. The Indian and Chinese states are the achievements of the masses of people who fought for and won their independence. The Indian and Chinese states delivered great progress to their people through the reform of agriculture, the development of industry, the flourishing of education, and broadening of horizons for the poor and oppressed. Despite having different types of government, both states represent the democratic aspirations of the people of Asia for peace, land, and bread. They share a common goal of erasing the legacy of hunger, social backwardness, illiteracy, and poverty left by colonialism. They share a common future for the end of the era of Europe and the beginning of an era of humanity. The West today, as my colleagues have mentioned, is in deep crisis. The streets of American cities are lined with opioid addicts and the homeless. A majority of Americans no longer believe in the legitimacy of American democracy, with 52% believing that elections do not reflect the will of the people. America's abject defeat and failure in Afghanistan damaged their credibility with allies from Taiwan to Ukraine. The Trump election showed the will of the American people for imperial retreat, and the country has, been, has never been more disunited than perhaps any time since the Civil War along political, class, and ideological lines. Financial Times commentator Martin Wolf has proclaimed the strange death of American democracy. The declining West responds to a rising Asia the only way it knows how, through projection and bullying. The West accuses China of a genocide against Uyghurs, debt trap diplomacy, and aggression in the South China Sea. Political scientists say China is authoritarian and stifles freedom. Western leftists throw up accusations of labor unrest in China and debate impotently about whether China is socialist state capitalist or state capitalist. The Indian state faces similar attacks, not only from the Western media, but from its Western trained intelligentsia. Harvard technocrats like Jagdish Bhagwati declare the efforts of the Indian state builders as failure 
and trace all of its gains to Indian investment. On the so-called left, the likes of Ranajit Guha, Arundhati Roy, and Gayatri Spivak attack the Indian state as inherently oppressive. As Raju was saying, they proclaim anti-elitism, but they had never attacked the Western universities they draw their legitimacy from. They paint the Indian people as inherently fascist and hopelessly divided, but attack the initiatives to unite the people and help them progress to their highest potential. They speak endlessly of defending the constitution, but never of defending the state and its achievements. Whatever the government in power, the state, that is the capacity of the people to change their situations must be defended. It is the only mechanism against which the people can resist imperialism. The historical experience of India and China is testament. Despite the external and internal propaganda against Asia, post-colonial states were spectacularly successful in their first attempts to reconstruct their society from the wreckage of colonialism. As economist Surendra J. Patel writes, the Global South achieved a golden age of development from 1950 to 1980, unprecedented in human history. They did what the Global North did in 80 years in half the time with twice the growth rates and with five times the North's population. The South went from 0.5 growth per year, probably less, from 1850 to 1950 to 5.3% per year from 1950 to 1980. Infant mortality dropped dramatically and life expectancy shot up from less than 40 years old to over 60. Literacy and university education spread rapidly among a people hungry for education. In India, the five-year plans laid the basis of a modern self-sufficient state out of a nation saddled with stagnant agriculture, little to no industry, and mass illiteracy and social backwardness. Our freedom fighters created a native industry relatively free from the exploitation of Western capitalists. They, they created, they, they achieved self-sufficiently, self-sufficiency in capital goods, created universities that have educated some of the world's finest scientists and engineers, achieved food sovereignty and began the process of redistributing land. Our long process of land reform began with the abolition of Zamindari in the early 1950s. Tenant reforms gave tenants ownership for their lands for a fair price. Land sealing legislations distributed surplus land to millions of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe people. Bank nationalization under Indira Gandhi made credit available to small industries, road transporters, self-employed people and farmers, enabling more people to take advantage of the prosperity of the green revolution. Despite setbacks of a low land to man ratio, and the entrenchment of vested interests. The democratization of land created opportunity and growth for millions of people. As Nehru said on the eve of land reforms in Uttar Pradesh, you will find a new light on the faces of peasants, both Hindus and Muslims, who had been poor and downtrodden for centuries. They are unable to believe that the land they now own is their very own. The achievements of the Indian state, that is to say, the achievements of the Indian people, enabled India to stand proudly in the world as a non-aligned power, supporting freedom struggles from Vietnam to Palestine to M Namibia. All around the world, Indians still bear the goodwill of other oppressed peoples for their sacrifices. In our times, the prop of propaganda of history has pushed India towards the West. Do our bidding, they say, and only then you can progress. The West seeks to use democracy as a wedge between India and China when it suits them. The Western orchestrated Quad Alliance of Japan, Australia, the United States, and India claims to be an alliance of democracies against authoritarianism. However, an understanding of democracy inherited from our freedom struggle would suggest that we have more in common with Chinese strivings than dead Western definitions. The first commonality with the Chinese system is that both countries believe fundamentally that democracy means giving opportunity to the poor. As Nehru said in his tryst with destiny speech on the eve of our independence, that the future is not one of ease or resting, but of incessant striving so that we may fulfill the pledges we have so often taken and the one we shall take today. The service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. It means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. 
The progressive movements of India at their best grounded themselves in the people. They were in tune with their aspirations and waged an ideological war against those who would exploit the poor in the name of sectarian interests. Even when they were not in power, they drew their legitimacy from their work in the villages, mobilizing and guiding the people, a direct legacy of the cadre of the freedom struggle. Similarly, the Communist Party of China has embraced the concept of a whole process democracy in which people's congresses ensure full participation and, practice, and practices of the people beyond elections. Xi Jinping said, democracy is not an ornament to be used for decoration. It is to be used to solve the problems that the people want to solve. Whether a country is a democracy or not depends on whether its people are really the masters of a country, Xi said. By that yardstick, China's democracy has su succeeded spectacularly with the eradication of extreme poverty that took the participation of the entire society. An American survey company, much to their disbelief, found that 95.5% of Chinese people are relatively or highly satisfied with Beijing compared to just 35% of Americans. And the number is surely lower um, because that poll was taken in 2016. The second commonality with the Chinese system is that both countries believe in democracy among nations. India has historically seen imperialism as the enemy of world democracy because it stopped countries from choosing their own destinies. In his speeches at Bandung and at the Non-Aligned Movement, Nehru counterposed democracy and independence with empire, not with communism. As he said in his Belgrade speech, imperialism has tried to usurp the real meaning of freedom and to make newly born independence a mere artificial contrivance, which reflects no genuine fact. The Panchil principles laid out in 1954 with, between the US and China gave the world a practical demonstration about the peaceful coexistence of different systems so that they may exist democratically. They advocated for respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, non-aggression, non-interference, equality and mutual benefit and peaceful coexistence. The CPC today defends the sovereignty of Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, Syria, Afghanistan, and other countries under attack by the West. As Xi Jinping has said, it is itself undemocratic to use a single yardstick to measure the rich and varied political systems and examine the diverse political civilizations of humanity from a monotonous per perspective. Finally, India and China share a common understanding of democracy as part of a millennia old spiritual striving. The history of Buddhism filled our cultures with deep insights about the purpose of life. Our saints revealed that life is not about the accumulation of material goods, but about love for ourselves, for humanity, and for the truth. Our civilization teaches us about the inescapable network of mutuality, the single garment of destiny. These civilizational values animated both the Long March and the Quit India movement by giving people the courage to risk their lives for a better future. This understanding of democracy encompasses a positive freedom to achieve one's potential, as opposed to a negative freedom from the state, which is the democracy of the liberal West. As Madam Sunyat Sen said during her visit to India, this mutual respect has through millennia engendered peaceful contacts between our countries, which is indeed unique in the annals of men. This precious heritage, enhanced by our common struggle over long years against colonial oppression, provided the foundation upon which we have built the harmonious bonds which link us in the present era. The long freedom struggles of India and China draw upon the wisdom of the past to bring the world to a new age, free from corruption, selfishness, and violence of Western rule. The myth of Indian and Chinese inferiority fuels the imperialist world system because it represents the West as the protagonist of history. This myth has the effect of preventing us from seeing our agency at a time when a new world is within our reach. Rather than be the attack dogs of the West, we must build upon the foundation set by our ancestors for true freedom and true democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Meghna. Uh, our next speaker is Ram Mohan Rai. Uh, he'd be speaking in Hindi and I'll ask uh, Raju to translate him. 
The title of his presentation is 100 years of Pakistan. Priya Sathyo, Purba, Artishman Raju or Meghna ne bohoti sundar dhang se bohoti etihasik paripeksh me sampoorn hamare etihas ka us sare ghatna kram ka Bindu wise, एक एक बिंदु को लेकर अच्छा वृत्तांत रखा है मैं समझता हूं कि भारत और चीन की संस्कृति और सभ्यता हजारों वर्षों से एक ही रूप में ढली है और हमने इसको पढ़ा इस रूप में भी जब चीनी यात्री हुएन सांग और फाइयान भारत में आए और उन्होंने पूरे देश के अंदर बौद्ध विहारों का जा जाकर महाअध्ययन किया और बौद्ध साहित्य को अपने साथ चीन ले जाने की प्रयास भी किया ले भी गए वो उनका पूरा का पूरा साहित्य उनका लेखन हमें भारत और चीन के संबंधों को बहुत ही विस्तार से बताता है पूर्वा ने आर्चिशमान राजू ने और मेघना ने इन तमाम संबंधों की घड़ी चाहे वो ऐतिहासिक हो चाहे वो भारतीय राष्ट्रीय आजादी के आंदोलन के दौरान के हों और आज के वर्तमान परिप्रेक्ष में जब संपूर्ण वेस्टर्न जगत हमारे देश को ही नहीं चीन के संबंधों को ही नहीं बल्कि तमाम जो ऐसे देश हैं जो प्रगतिशील हैं उनको बदनाम करना चाहता है उनके एक एक बात को रखा है मैं यहाँ कहना चाहूंगा कि मैं मौत से तुम के ही एक उससे शुरू करूंगा मेरी गुरु निर्मला देश पांडे जी इस बात को बेहतर ढंग से रखती थी कि जब भारत के पहले राजदूत चीन में क्रांति के बाद गए और माउथ से तुमको उन्होंने अपने क्रीडेंशियल्स भेंट किए तो माओ ने एक बात कही कि जानते हो प्रिय राजदूत हमारे देश में क्या कहावत है हमारे देश में कहावत है कि जो चीन में सारी जिंदगी अच्छे कर्म करता है उसको अगला जन्म भारत में मिलता है बुद्ध भूमि भारत में मिलता है अब मैं नहीं जानता कि ये कितनी सच्ची है पर कितनी बात है परंतु ये बात अवश्य है कि भारत और चीन के जो संबंध रहे हैं वो बहुत ही न केवल सभ्यता के तौर पर संस्कृति के रूप में बल्कि आध्यात्मिक रूप से भी राजनीतिक रूप से भी बड़े सशक्त रहे हैं मैं इस बात को दूसरे ढंग से कहना चाहूंगा मैं थोड़ा सा कि भारत का जो यस हाँ अनुवाद कर दू या आप हाँ हाँ कीजिए कीजिए सो राममोहन जी सेड दैट इन यू नो मेघना पूर्वा एंड चश्मान हैव पुट एक्सपोजिशन ऑफ रिलेशनशिप्स ऑफ इंडिया एंड चाइना इन अ हिस्टोरिक कॉन्टेक्स्ट एंड he said that he thinks that india and china's culture and civilization have been linked together for more than for thousands of years and uh, he and this is the evidence of this is for example in hyun sang's trip uh, to india uh, and to nalanda and his hyun sang taking back buddhist literature back to china uh, and uh, he again mentioned that uh, uh, purva chishma and meghna have talked of these Uh, the relationship of india and china in a historical but also in the current political context uh, and he said that his mentor nirmala deshpande used to say that when india's first ambassador went to china and presented his credentials to mao zedong uh, then mao told him uh, that in in china there is a saying that those who do good deeds in china uh, their next birth is in uh, their born again in india uh, and so मैं इसमें इस बात को कहना चाहूंगा 
कि भारत की आजादी का संपूर्ण आंदोलन साम्राज्यवाद विरोधी संघर्ष का हिस्सा था महात्मा गांधी ने इस बात को बार बार कहा कि भारत को आजादी किस लिए चाहिए गांधी जी ने कहा भारत को आजादी इसलिए चाहिए कि हम दुनिया के तमाम देशों के लोगों की सेवा कर सके पंडित नेहरू ने भी इसी बात को रखते हुए कहा कि भारत की आजादी का लड़ाई अंतरराष्ट्रीय स्तर पर जो साम्राज्यवाद के विरोध में लड़ाई लड़ी जा रही है उसका हिस्सा है एक उदाहरण देते हुए उन्होंने इस बात को रखा कि 1936 में जब जनरल फ्रांको स्पेन में वहां की जनतांत्रिक सरकार को का तख्ता पलटना चाहता था तब नेहरू ने कांग्रेस के मंच से कहा था कि हमारी आजादी की लड़ाई स्पेन के मैदान में लड़ रही है लड़ी जा रही है तो ये चरित्र हमारे देश का था कि हम साम्राज्यवाद के विरुद्ध संघर्ष में जो दे दुनिया भर में लड़ाई जा, लड़ी जा रही थी उसका एक हिस्सा थे राजू इंडियाज कैंपेन इन इंडिया स्ट्रगल फॉर फ्रीडम वॉज अ कैंपेन अगेंस्ट इम्पीरियलिज्म एंड गांधी जी यूज टू से सेवरल टाइम्स दैट इंडिया वॉन्ट्स फ्रीडम सो दैट वी कैन सर्व द वर्ल्ड Pandit Nehru also used to say that India's fight for freedom is part of the world's struggle against imperialism. And giving the example of uh, the Spanish Civil War uh, and General Franco, um, he would say that the, India's fight for freedom is being fought uh, in the uh, battle lines of Spain. In me, jab sham samant shahi ke khilaaf. किसान संघर्ष चल रहा था मौत से तुम के नेतृत्व में चीन की कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी के नेतृत्व में उस समय भी भारत की जनता की एकजुटता उसके प्रति थी हमारा ऐसा मानना है कि सन 1947 में जब भारत का ने अंग्रेज साम्राज्यवाद से आजादी हासिल की उसके बाद न केवल चीन में अपितु दुनिया के अनेक देशों के अंदर जो साम्राज्यवादी गुलामी के फंदे थे उससे निजात पाई गई मैं इस बात को इस तरह से कहना चाहूंगा कि इस 1948 की क्रांति के बाद कृषि प्रधान ग्रामीण चीन एक विकसित औद्योगिक देश के रूप में उभरा हम इस बात को जानते हैं कि सन 1960 के दशक में चीन और सोवियत संघ के अंदर जो अलगाव बढ़ा चीन ने सोवियत संघ को संशोधनवादी कहा और सोवियत संघ ने चीन को जो विस्तारवादी कहा उसका प्रभाव भी भारत के जो परिदृश्य था उस पर पड़ा और यहीं तक नहीं हुआ सरकारों पर ही नहीं पड़ा यहां की जो कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी थी उस पर भी पड़ा और उसका प्रभाव यह हुआ कि भारत की कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी भी इसी तरह से दो हिस्सों में बट गई पर इसके साथ साथ हम एक बात और देख रहे हैं कि भारतीय नेताओं और खास तौर से पंडित जवाहरलाल नेहरू और चीन के तत्कालीन प्रधानमंत्री चावन लाई ने जैसे कि अभी मेघना ने बात कही के पंचशील के सिद्धांत को लेकर उन लोगों ने काम किया और हिंदी चीनी भाई भाई का जो नारा था उस नारे का जो गूंज थी वो सिर्फ दिल्ली तक ही नहीं थी भारत के तमाम गांव के अंदर हिंदी चीनी भाई की गूंज थी और उसका कारण मैं समझता हूं क्योंकि हम समझते थे कि हमारे हमारी जो मैत्री है वो सिर्फ भौगोलिक नहीं है कोई सामाजिक नहीं है कोई राजनीतिक नहीं है बल्कि हमारी मैत्री आध्यात्मिक स्तर पर और हमारी मैत्री जनता के स्तर पर है राजू जी 
when uh, in china there was a fight there was a peasant struggle against feudalism led by mao zedong uh, at that time the indian masses were in support of the chinese struggle uh, and uh, when china in after the revolution in 1948 they emerged they emerged from you know a predominantly peasant economy and eventually became a developed industrial country uh, that had effects not just in china but around the world uh the after that of course there was a period of the sino soviet split uh where the chinese called the um uh, you know they're calling soviets uh, revisionist um uh, and you know for being called expansionist uh and that split was also reflected in the indian communist party uh which also got split along those lines but at the same time nehru and zawalai after independence they worked together uh, for a framework of peace under panchil and the slogan of hindi chini bhai bhai was not just heard in delhi but it was heard uh, throughout the country and this was because the connection between india and china is not simply geographical uh, it's not simply political but it really is a deep spiritual connection at the level of the masses of our people बहुत ही दुर्भाग्यपूर्ण रहा जब उन्नीस के अंदर भारत और चीन की सेनाओं के बीच भूमि विवाद को लेकर एक लड़ाई लड़ी गई उस लड़ाई के बाद जो भावना बनी थी वो हमारे देश के अंदर लोगों के बीच में टूटी कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी ऑफ सोवियत यूनियन और चाइनीज कम्युनिस्ट पार्टियों की दूरी ने भारत में भी न केवल दोनों पार्टियों के बीच में दूरी पैदा की बल्कि लोगों के विचारों के अंदर भी एक निराशा की बात हुई इसके बावजूद भी भारत के स्वतंत्रता आंदोलन के जो बड़े नेता थे जो कम्युनिस्ट पार्टियों के नेता भी थे एस से डांगे अजय घोष वासुपुनैया ये सब लोग चीन गए और कोशिश की कि किस तरह हम लोग इन तमाम झगड़ों को जो दोनों देशों के बीच में आए हैं उनको हम जनता के स्तर पर निपटा सकते हैं उन्नीस के बाद आज तक अनेक वार्ताएं हुई हैं परंतु हमारा भूमि विवाद नहीं हल हुआ है न केवल पंडित नेहरू उसके बाद इंदिरा गांधी राजीव गांधी और इसी तरह से चीन की तरफ से भी अनेक वहां के राष्ट्राध्यक्षों ने बातचीत की है परंतु बातचीत हल नहीं हुई मैं इस बात को इस रूप में कहना चाहता हूं कि भूमि विवाद अलग जगह है ये जो राजनयिक संबंध हैं ये अलग हैं पर जनता के स्तर पर ये प्रयास जारी रहने चाहिए मैं ये भी समझता हूं कि चीन ने अपने आर्थिक सामाजिक विकास 1948 के बाद बड़े पैमाने पर किया है भारत को ये बहुत ही सीखने की जरूरत है कि, कि किस तरह चीन ने अपने 80 प्रतिशत आबादी जो कि गरीबी रेखा से भी नीचे थी किस तरह उनको विकसित करके एक अच्छे संपन्न बेहतर जीवन जीने का अवसर दिया है इट इज अनफॉर्चुनेट दैट इन 1962 देर वॉज बॉर्डर वॉर बिटवीन इंडिया एंड चाइना बॉर्डर डिस्प्यूट एंड फाइटिंग एंड ऑल्सो द रिफ्ट बिटवीन द सोवियत एंड द चाइनीज एंड द कॉम्युनिस्ट पार्टी ऑफ चाइना क्रिएटेड अ रिफ्ट Uh, in the world communist movement but also between the two communist parties um in india and it also created disappointment among uh, many people the people of india uh, nevertheless despite that several communist leaders uh, including uh, dange sa dange ajay ghosh uh, they went to china and they tried to resolve these differences uh, thinking that they could be resolved at the level of the people and uh, even prime ministers nehru indira gandhi and rajiv gandhi tried to resolve the border dispute 
with several different talks that happened, but these disputes have so far not been resolved. Nevertheless, we must continue an effort um, at the level of the people uh, to continue to establish good relations between India and China. Uh, I, it, the China's uh, record, China's recent economic advancement and uh, poverty elevation, taking away a country which had more than 80% of its population behind uh, below poverty, for them to um, abolish extreme poverty uh, is very significant and worthy of study. मैं यहाँ जरूर कहना चाहूँगा कि जो भूमि विवाद चीन के हुए हैं वो सिर्फ भारत से ही नहीं हुए वियतनाम से भी हुए कंबोडिया से भी हुए परंतु समय रहते उन दोषों उन देशों के संबंध चीन के साथ बेहतर हुए हैं पर हमें इस बात का अफसोस है कि जिस तरह मेघना ने बार बार इस बात को रखा कि वेस्टर्न लोग जो हैं वो नहीं चाहते कि हमारे संबंध अच्छे हों अगर हमारे बेहतर संबंध होते हैं तो हम चीन के विकास के जो सिद्धांत हैं चीन ने जिस तरह से विकास किया है चीन ने जो अपनी जनता को अपनी शक्ति बनाकर उसका सदुपयोग किया है हम भारतीय ढंग से उसको सीख सकते हैं आज पूरी दुनिया अमेरिका और चीन के दो धुरियों के बीच में खड़ी है अमेरिका खुद आंतरिक निराशा में है और किस तरह से आर्थिक संकट से जूझ रहा है वो हमारे सामने है इसके मुकाबले में चीन एक बहुत अच्छी बड़ी आर्थिक शक्ति के रूप में उभरा है हम ये भी देख रहे हैं कि अफगानिस्तान के अंदर किस तरह से अमेरिका अमेरिकन सेना विश्वासघात करके जनता के साथ तुम दबाकर भागी है ऐसी स्थिति में आज इस बात की जरूरत है कि भारत और चीन की जनता मिलकर मैं यहां जनता का प्रयोग कर रहा हूं मैं देशों का प्रयोग नहीं कर रहा देशों की स्थितियां हो सकती हैं देशों की अपनी समझदारी हो सकती है देश के नेताओं की जो सत्ता में लोग बैठे हैं वो कि नहीं दबाव में हो सकते हैं परंतु अगर आप जनता के स्तर पर बात करें मैं आम जनता के स्तर पर कहना चाहता हूं कि अगर भारत और चीन के लोगों के बीच अच्छे संबंध बनेंगे हमारे बीच जो हमारे सदियों से संबंध है उनको पुनर्जागृत करके बढ़ने का काम हम करेंगे तो निश्चित रूप से एक बहुत बड़ा एक नई दिशा का हमें आगाज होगा मैं आज के इस अवसर पर अपनी गुरु निर्मला देश पांडे जी को जरूर स्मरण करना चाहूंगा वे बरसों तक इंडो चाइना फ्रेंडशिप सोसाइटी की वाइस प्रेसिडेंट रही और उनके नारे थे बोली नहीं बोली चाहिए उनका नारा था चीन के संदर्भ में था युद्ध नहीं बुद्ध चाहिए उनका नारा था हमारे पड़ोसी देशों के संबंध में था जंग नहीं अमन चाहिए आज की स्थिति में अगर हम इन बातों पर उतरते हैं और चीन की कम्युनिस्ट पार्टी की सोवी साल गिरा पर भारत की जनता के बीच हम उस संदेश को ले जाने की कोशिश करें देश सरकारों के माध्यम से नहीं जाएगा व्यापारिक उत्पाद के माध्यम से नहीं जाएगा बेशक चीन का माल कितना हमारे यहाँ आ रहा है कितना हम उसका उपयोग कर रहे हैं उसके माध्यम से नहीं जाएगा पर जो चीन का और हमारे जो संबंध है जो हमारी और उनकी आध्यात्मिक से मेरा अर्थ बिल्कुल धार्मिक नहीं है आध्यात्मिक से मेरा अर्थ है आंतरिक अगर हम उन आंतरिक संबंधों की तरफ बढ़ेंगे लोगों के बीच में ले जाएंगे तो मैं कह सकता हूं एक जनता के व्यक्ति के तौर पर निचले स्तर पर निचले पायदान पर काम करने वाले कार्यकर्ता के रूप में कि अगर कोई समझता है कि कौन हमारे साथ खड़ा होगा किसी भी युद्ध हमारे अगर छोटी बात करके मैं कहूं हमारे पड़ोसी साथ होगा या कोई दूरस्थ देश का व्यक्ति खड़ा होगा तो निश्चित रूप से कोई पड़ोसी खड़ा होगा 
और अगर आज भारत और चीन अपनी तमाम जो विवाद के विषय हैं उनको भी रखते हुए उनका भी हल किया जाए पर उनको भी रखते हुए अगर एक दूसरे को समझने की तरफ बढ़ें तो निश्चित रूप से दुनिया को नए आयाम मिलेंगे मैं आपका जो आज आयोजन हुआ है मैं उसमें एक सार्थक बात देखता हूं सार्थक बात यह है कि अभी तक जनता के स्तर पर आम जनता के स्तर पर हम कैसे काम करें इसकी कोई रूपरेखा योजना नहीं आई पर ये जो पहल है जैसे पहले पूर्वा ने कहा कि कमेटी फॉर फ्रेंडशिप बिटवीन इंडिया एंड चाइना जो बनी है ये टेम्पररी कमेटी हमने बनाई है बेशक बनाई है पर अगर इस तरह के काम इस तरह की कमेटी से अगर लोगों के बीच में घुसकर सिर्फ सुप्तावस्था है जब आप जगाने का काम करेंगे तो निश्चित रूप से ये शक्ति जो भारत और चीन की शक्ति है जो आंतरिक शक्ति है वो जाग जाएगी और हमारे मैत्री संबंधों को लेकर एक नया आंदोलन खड़ा होगा um i would uh, i would like to say that the border disputes uh, that happened between uh, china uh, and india india was not the only country with the china had border disputes but they also had disputes with vietnam and cambodia but with time uh, relations between these uh, have uh, improved these countries have become better they have improved and uh, we are disappointed that the western uh, ruling class does not want the relations between india and china to improve uh, china has leveraged its people the strength of its people for its uh, advancement and i think we can learn from their experiment uh, in an indian context and you know by interpreting what it could be look like in an indian context Uh, the standoff the, between us and china uh, has embroiled the whole world the whole world will come uh, you know has come uh, within it and uh, we have also recently seen how the us has uh, fled from afghanistan and i think all of these things make it important that at the level of the people and i am emphasizing at the level of the people i am not using the word nation Uh, we have to uh, lead. We have to uh, lead to a new awakening um, of friendship between the two countries. At, on this occasion, I would like to uh, remember my mentor Nirmala Deshpande, who for a long time was the vice president of the India-China Friendship Association, uh, and she gave the slogans, uh, which I'll sort of roughly translate: that uh, not guns but talk, not war but both, not war but peace. um and uh, i don't think economic relations purely can resolve our differences uh, between india and china but these differences have to be resolved at the level of the people uh, and it has to be um resolved at a spiritual and by spiritual i don't mean religious uh, but at a level which touches the heart of the people and uh, Uh, who will we have to think about who will be with us in the long term will it be our neighbor or will it be some far off entity uh, and i think if india and china come together they will lead to new dimensions in the world um, and uh, we have to think about how to take these ideas among the people and this temporary committee that has been formed for the friendship of india and china um, which is a uh, good but this uh, has to once these ideas Uh, are really taken uh, among the people they will acquire a new uh, spirit and uh, truly a new awakening for the friendship a new struggle for the friendship of india and china beshak hamara ye prayas bahut chhota hai bahut hi limit mein hai parantu ye bahut mahatvapurna prayas hai aur is prayas ko jan jan tak le jane ki कोशिश होनी चाहिए मैं अपनी ओर से गांधी ग्लोबल फैमिली जो कि एक राष्ट्रीय संगठन है उसकी ओर से एसोसिएशन ऑफ पीपल्स ऑफ एशिया जो निर्मला देश पांडे जी ने खास तौर से 
भारत और चीन और दूसरे पड़ोसी देशों के साथ लोगों के बीच दोस्ती के लिए बनाई थी मैं उनकी ओर से आपको यकीन दिलाता हूं कि हम सब अगर कोई कार्य योजना बनाकर काम करना शुरू करेंगे तो निश्चित रूप से उसके बहुत अच्छे प्रतिफल सामने आएंगे ये काम जरूरी नहीं है बल्कि आज की बहुत बड़ी जरूरत है और इसके लिए मैं चाहूंगा कि एक यथार्थ रूप से एक बहुत ही प्रैक्टिकल काम किया जाए और हम सब उसके अंदर सहभागी बने आज आपकी तरफ से मुझे अपनी बात रखने का मौका मिला मैं आपका धन्यवाद अदा करता हूं और खास तौर से डॉक्टर एंथनी का एंथोनी आप यहाँ बैठे हैं मैं आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत करता हूं अभिनंदन करता हूं आप किस तरह से दूर देश में बैठे हुए पूरी दुनिया के लोगों को एकजुट करने का काम और खास तौर से जो साम्राज्यवाद की साजिशें हैं उनके उनको बेपर्दा करने का काम कर रहे हैं और हम सब लोग आपसे आपके विचारों से निश्चित रूप से प्रभावित हैं और ये विचार भारत में भी फैले ये विचार भारत के लोगों के बीच में भी जाए मैं ऐसी कामना करता हूं और आपका पुनः धन्यवाद अदा करता हूं Our effort as part of the committee of uh, um, friendship of Indian and Chinese people uh, is surely it is it may be small, uh, but I think it is very important, uh, and we have to take uh, this effort among the people. I am myself doing this through Gandhi Global Family, which is a national institution. Uh, also, the Association of Peoples of Asia, uh, which was founded by um, Nirmala Deshpande. and you should believe me that if we make a strategy uh, and work within it this will lead to very important and um, good consequences uh, and i think this work is not just uh, important but it is required for today it is necessary work for today uh, and i think we should work to formulate a realistic and practical strategy under which uh, we can do this work i think i thank uh, Uh, all of you but also i thank in particular dr anthony uh, montero in how he is um, working to bring people together across uh, nations uh, and uh, he is working tirelessly to reveal the conspiracies of imperialism and i assure him that when these ideas go among the people uh, they will uh, lead to um, a new awakening and important consequences thank you ramohan ji for that beautiful presentation which underlines the spiritual connection a connection of the hearts between the indian and chinese people i'd like to say for all our uh, viewers that ramohan rai is a peace activist and a gandhian who follows in the footsteps of nirmala deshpande and vinoba bhave he is editor in chief of the magazine nitya nutan and general secretary of gandhi global family and is part of organizing the aagaaz e dosti yatra each year for india pakistan friendship thank you ramohan ji at this point uh, we'll have a discussion based on the panel presentations i would once again like to thank all our panelists for those great presentations um i would ask our participants on zoom to raise their hands and i i'll call on them for uh, putting forward their questions and comments um maybe dr montero would like to make some comments
dog i think you're 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 muted yeah i'm sorry uh yes uh thank you very much i <laughs> i can't tell you how how thrilled i am to be a part of this um you know i have to say you know you hesitate to speak uh because you know you just i'm just overwhelmed at what has been achieved here and i do know something of how difficult it was for um archisman and and um ananditha to organize this uh and i have to say i'm not unfamiliar with political difficulties in trying to move things forward but what i wanted to uh, say is i i firmly agree with this idea of the people and that in these times uh it is the people who are the decisive agents of remaking history and i think this is a different situation than let us say before the chinese revolution and the indian independence was achieved uh with all of the difficulties of states of war and peace still it is the people and i i firmly agree with the way uh, magna put things contrasting the fact that the chinese state has evolved into a state of the people of the whole people and that the us state has devolved into a hollowed out uh set of institutions that serve only a tiny part of the american people uh i guess in saying this i would like to humbly address some of the indian elites who when they make arguments about democracy always point or or generally point to the united states uh and they use uh american and i put quotes here democracy weaponized against the indian independence movement and against their neighbor china uh so this uh this misunderstanding of what is going on in the united states uh is a, a problem uh for the indian elite uh as raju mentioned uh just just a small um story i'd like to tell you about uh on friday uh chumbarta and purba purba and i had the opportunity to spend many hours together and they're new to philadelphia so i wanted to show them around and um we began in uh one of the richest parts of the city and we ended up in one of the poorest parts of the city and this is an area with an open air drug market in fact the most lucrative drug market in the united states and probably the world this drug market brings in about a billion dollars a year and they saw a a side of philadelphia an important part of philadelphia that is obscured uh to those who come to do research at universities or who are not poor or part of the working poor the working class in philadelphia 
And in this area known as Kensington, there are hundreds of young people who are addicted to the most addicting opioids ever known. Not just heroin, not just crack cocaine, but fentanyl and methamphetamines. And as we drove around this area, we saw young people shooting up heroin on the street. And we saw uh, these encampments of homeless and drug addicted people. And Chambarta and Purba were shocked. They were in a state of shock. They couldn't speak. And they said to me that they see poverty all the time in India. India is not a developed, rich, so-called rich country. But they had never seen in India what they witnessed in Philadelphia. Now, where does all this come from? What is the cause of this? And what I would say to those who think that the argument for democracy um, is a should be a defense of the institutions and life world of the United States, many of those who are in India and other countries who do not know the United States, that they need to come to Philadelphia. They need to go on a tour of the part of Philadelphia that I took Purba and Chambarta on. To understand the United States at this time, you have to understand the descent into poverty, the descent into destitution, into homelessness, into hunger, into something that looks like Dante's hell. And that's what they experienced. But in the meantime, the elite of the United States are making these arguments that the United States is the beacon of democracy in the world. Um, I just like to, you know, kind of read just to end. I don't want to talk too long. Uh, there was, you know, everybody's aware of all of the uh, writings of uh, US elites about the crisis of democracy and how the United States is losing its democracy. Uh, I think Magna mentioned uh, Martin Wolf, his article in the Financial Times, which was an amplification upon an article by the American neoliberal pro-war intellectual, Robert Kagan. His article appeared in the Washington Post. I don't recall the title, the exact title, but what he was saying is that the United States faces a constitutional crisis more severe than the constitutional crisis that led to the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s. Um, Kagan said that the nation is divided, the center has collapsed, the state is in crisis. The uh, rule of law is only hanging on by a thin reed. And that the United States could easily tip into a violent civil war. And that the elite have to decide whether they will abandon the constitutional and legal means of struggle and go into the realm of a state of emergency, extra legal means and violence to put down a population which is angry, which is uh, more poor than ever before and are not unlike the people that Purba and Chabarta and I witnessed in Kensington. Now, there's another article uh, in a prestigious journal that I'd like to draw your attention to. 
and that is in the journal Foreign Affairs, uh, the most prestigious from the standpoint of the elites uh, foreign policy journal in the United States. And this essay, I think, appears in the September-October uh, edition. And it's an article by a woman uh, whose, name, whose name is Sarah Chase, C-H-A-Y-E-S. And she was a US government official in Afghanistan for many years. And she knows Afghanistan. And she makes the, ar the article is about Afghanistan, by the way. And she makes the argument that the Af Afghan state collapsed, not because uh, of, you know, uh, these extreme Islamist or terrorist, uh, but that the Afghan, Afghan state collapsed because of corruption. That the people felt humiliated and their dignity was undermined by their very state that was supposed to represent them. In other words, if you went to get a driver's license, you not only paid for the license, but you had to pay a, a corruption fee to a government official. So she says the Afghan state was hollowed out and increasingly the Taliban became this broad movement of opposition to this corrupt US sponsored state. But this writer, Sarah Chase asked the question. Now I'd like to quote her if you don't mind and then I'll uh, finish. She writes, quote, for all the mismanagement and corruption that hollowed out the Afghan state, consider this. How well have American leaders been in governing in recent years? They have started and lost wars, turned free markets over to an unfettered financial services industry that proceeded to nearly bring down the global economy, colluded in burgeoning opi an burgeoning opioid crisis and bungled, bungled their response to a global pandemic. And they have promulgated policies that have hastened environmental catastrophes, raising the question of how much longer the earth will sustain human habitation. And how have the architects of these disasters and their cronies been doing? Never better. Consider the skyrocketing incomes and assets of, ex of executives in the fossil fuel and pharmaceutical industries, investment bankers and defense contractors, as well as the lawyers and other professionals who provide them with high-end services. Their staggering wealth and comfortable protection from the calamities they have unleashed attest to their success. Not success at leadership, of course, but maybe leadership isn't their objective. Maybe like their Afghan counterparts, their primary objective is just making money. I'll just end on this because I think there has to be a wake up, an awakening uh, in, in places like uh, India among elites who seem to be uh, enthralled with American propaganda and know very little of the realities of the American uh, uh, political system and how the people of America feel about their own government. And I can tell you, they don't look kindly upon their own government. And they, the American people are on the edge of an uprising, the likes of which the country has not seen in over 150 years. Uh, all claims made by the US elites about democracy will be thrown out of the window, not by the elites, but by the very people who have been the victims of this corrupt ruling class 
that has left tens of millions of people in poverty, addicted to the most uh, dangerous opioids and drugs and living on the street. You have to see it to believe it. Uh, I'll stop there. And I, I, I really just want to express my deep gratitude uh, for this event and for all of the presentations. I've learned so much. So thank you guys very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Montero. Uh, Dr. Montero is the founder of the Sta Saturday Free School for Philosophy and Black Liberation in the city of Philadelphia. Um, Next, I'd like to ask Mr. Bhaskaran, who is the General Secretary of the India-China Friendship, Friendship Association, to say a few words, if you will. Mr. Bhaskaran, uh, you're, you're muted. We can't hear you. Maybe we can take a maybe. Okay. Um Okay, uh, maybe I'll read out oh, a comment. I think he's unmuted oh. now. Okay, okay. Can you hear? Yes. 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 Okay. And I wanted to tell you a few words. India China Friendship Association, little bit history. And we, Karnataka, here, first November 1949, we first formed. And we are the people who first took a delegation to China before. Government of India officially establishing a diplomatic relation. There are so many things. Our aim is people to people friendship, to strengthen the people to people friendship between the people of India and China in various levels. And it is a democratic organization, anti imperialist in character. And another thing, various levels, people to people friendship has been developed. Particularly in Karnataka, we are having more than 10 provinces, provincial level relationship and city to city relationship, film exhibition and uh, uh, cultural exchange, all this. From India and China. And in the year 90, I will tell you what, but India and China relationship has been shortened more than five years. Yon Sen and already the religious monk also visited exchange. Further, in 1857, first war of independence, led by Mr. Asimullah Khan, he visited China during that time. He established a very strong friendship. And that friendship had been built up a foundation stone it was continuing. And again, 1927, the Munich Party of China and met Brazil in Nehru, and they made some agreement. They have a bilateral purpose. Our relationship was very, very closely going on. But at the same time, after the establishment of, or whatever, maybe 1962, unpleasant situation takes place. This is, everyone knows about it. But we, the India-China Friendship Association, stood with the Chinese people, and we were trying to normalize the relationship. And 1976, ambassador level exchange, it took place 1988, visit of Rajiv Gandhi. It is a great day, yet another history on India-China friendship relationship. And he put a foundation to This is the thing. And still, the discussion is going on. And today, uh, so many of our rulers, one day they will tell, they will make it, they are not serious about it. And all of a sudden, they are already started now. They're telling some policies about attacking Gandhi. Gandhi is not a father of nation. You may be knowing also. This is the way our political people are telling, and it is a very good thing. And we stood for various levels 
come what may, India, China peoples are to be stand there, and it is day by day it is going on. So that is the purpose of our association, and particularly we are even under the years of the Communist Party of China. I also contributed, and because of the COVID-19, we are not able to gather, and so many things are there. And every year we are having so many activities. No, no, I don't want because time short and other things. And I really thank you very much. You are invited me to talk in few words. This is what I did. And whenever there is that, whenever there is a meeting, you'll wait. I am ready to join also. No problem there. So our aim and object is very, very, very clear. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bhaskaran. Um, Nandita, would you like to say some? something yeah i just uh, i just wanted to make a comment in response to what uh, dr montero and mr bhaskaran said because um, i just think that you know i mean some people might think why we are discussing the united states when we when the event is aimed at talking about india china peace and i just want to make clear that um, you know you know people to people friendship and activities of that sort have their place but nothing can be done if we don't have an analysis of imperialism and uh, i think that uh, you know even um well i guess you could say this about the peace movement also uh, which uh, you know i mean started um, much before uh, romesh chandra came on to the scene of the world peace council but before he was at the head of the world peace council the peace movement was more or less a European, um, you know, kind of limited to the European world and uh, limited to circles of, uh, uh, you know, intellectuals and elites. And he made the contribution that he added to the peace movement and an analysis of imperialism and of the Western, uh, you know, world order. And uh, with that, he took it to the people, like uh, Ram Mohanji was also saying. But I think that one cannot be done without the other. You need to talk about imperialism as you take it to the people. Um, and, you know, to take it to the people, in fact, without an analysis of imperialism is almost um, a betrayal, I think. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Nanta. I'm going to take a few comments from our Facebook live stream. Um, Emily Dong says, my parents have always told me that the Chinese from ancient times have always been fascinated with and felt love for Indian culture, leading to cultural exchanges along the Silk Road, but also leading to artists like singer Mei Lan Fang to talk to and build friendships with Tagore and Nandalal Bose. I wonder how this is significant with Meghna's point about democracy and the importance of India and China partnership in today's times. Uh, maybe I'll read one more comment and uh, you can uh, reply to this and uh, reply to this together. Alice Lee says, what has been the effect of the conflicts aberrations as noted by Meghna that have been taken advantage of by Western forces on the people of India and China? What is the significance of peace and friendship between India and China for the people of each respective country and the world? Meghna, would you like to uh, address that? And then maybe Raju and Ramohanji could add. Uh, I'm sorry, can you ju it just cut out for a second? Can you just uh, briefly say what they their questions were? Or by your muted. Oh. Oops, uh, let me uh, say that again. So Emily says that my parents have told me that Chinese from ancient times have always been fascinated with and felt love for Indian culture, leading to cultural exchanges along the Silk Road, but also leading to artists like singer Mei Lan Fang to talk to and build friendships with Tagore and Nandalal Bose. I wonder how this is significant with Meghna's point about democracy and the importance of India and China's partnership in today's times. Alice says, what has been the effect of the conflicts, aberrations as noted by Meghna that have taken advantage of, that have been taken advantage of by Western forces on the people of India and China? What is the significance of peace and friendship between India and China for the people of each respective country and the world? Yeah. 
Thank you. I mean, to Emily's question about culture, uh, this cultural exchange is important because part of the democratic renewal that has to happen with this transition to a new world order has to be the celebration of previously suppressed art and culture. So I think the kind of uh, exchange she's talking about on principled basis is very important. And that is also part of the struggle for democracy. Though it's not, I mean, you wouldn't get that from like Dr. Montero saying the way that the Western elite is framing it. I mean, their version of a democratic world is one where everybody watches Netflix. <laughs> but uh, the, the, um, a truly democratic rebirth would see, you know, culture and art being exchanged on our own terms. And we have a fantastic uh, foundation for that with Tagore. And to Alice's question, I mean, I think these conflicts and the ways that they're endlessly emphasized, and you kind of see it from the opposite end with the, in the 1962, with the way that, you know, there was this Western provoked aggression on, China, on, on India. Uh, I mean, you have the it's you, you have this thing of obscuring who the enemy is, you know, I mean, don't don't look at the, the, the forces of imperialism, which have impoverished your people for centuries. I mean, look to these relatively new and um, I mean, they have a certain motive behind them, uh, these attacks. Um, so, I mean, even I mean, even something like uh, Bhaskarinji was mentioning the trip of Rajiv Gandhi to uh, China. And I had not known, I mean, why is that discussion never a part of the way that the Indian elite is framing India-China relationships? That was such a fantastic visit. Uh, the kinds of things he spoke about, the, the foundations he was laying, the commonalities he was uh, trying to establish. But that is not, um, that, that contextualization, that history, that foundation upon which we need to build, uh, that is really obscured in today's climate. So especially, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a matter of emphasis, um, you know, yeah. Raju, Ram Mohanji, would you like to add to that? Uh, before I take another comment, uh, maybe Comrade Jaya could say a few words. Mm. Maybe Shukla ji could uh, join the conversation and say a few words. Okay, uh, Michelle, go ahead. I, I wanted to return to the point that Nandita made about how, you know, there can be there can be efforts and the messages of promoting peace between nations or a peoples. And I think that this is something that is seen oftentimes, but um, what it really needs to have a revolutionary force is in is an analysis of imperialism. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, the panelists, um, you know, what does the declining or the worsening global crisis that uh, Raju spoke about and also um, this rising imperative for unity between the Chinese and Indian people, you know, given that they are one third of the world's people and we're shifting to a new world order. I wanted to ask, you know, what all of this means for the task of um, Asians in the West and how that is going to change in the coming years. Maybe Raju, you can uh, respond first. Uh, sorry, I got caught up fixing some technical thing. Um, so I missed half of the question, but uh, uh, sorry, could you just quickly? Sorry, there's some technical issue I could resolve. Uh, I, okay, I wanted to ask in the context of the global crisis, uh, you know, the collapse of capitalism and imperialism and then the rise of a new world order and the need for, you know, unity between China and India. What does all of this mean for the task of Asians in the West and how is that changing? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Asians in the West have a much 
more of an influence now on the politics of Asia than they used to. I think certainly the Indian diaspora, for example, in the United States is now much more influential um, than uh, it used to be in determining the nature of Indian politics. And I think this is at various different levels. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, you could think in terms of, you know, universities and so on. Uh, a lot of the academics are very closely connected. Uh, but even at the level of, you know, businesses, at the level of media, um, it's, I think, in fact, quite uh, astonishing how much the influences and how much, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, the it's nowadays, I would even say there is a sense in which it's hard to discriminate um, the elite Indian from uh, the Indian in the United States. Many of their sensibilities have become similar. You know, like I think Meghna mentioned Netflix, watching Netflix or, uh, you know, even your, just what gives you your values, what gives you your, sen you know, sense of the world. Uh, and so I think because of that, there is an important role that uh, Asians in the West uh, uh, have to play. And I think they're in a unique position uh, where because they are in the West, they are in a position to explain the West to Asia. And, uh, uh, you know, that, and I think it's their role and their, um, uh, their role that they have to understand it, you know, understand the society they're living in um, and explain it. Uh, you know, in fact, if one thinks about it, that is the way that Asians, you know, used to interact with the West back in, you know, many Indian freedom fighters went to the US. For example, Lala Lajpat Rai, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Aruna Asaf Ali, these are names, uh, or, you know, Asaf Ali, her, these people would go to the US and then they would write about America and they would write about, uh, you know, explain American society uh, to um, the Indian people. Uh, and that nowadays it has instead become that you have Indians who go to the US and explain Indian society uh, to American people, you know, that has become their role to become the kind of arbitrals, the ones who will uh, represent Indian society. Uh, and I think it's a very um, uh, kind of dangerous shift that has taken place. And that's why there is an important role that Asians in the West have to play uh, to going back to, and you know, it's really wonderful actually to read back the accounts of these people like Lala Lajpatraya or Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, and they were always concerned um, with the people in the US, which we've been talking about. You know, they didn't try to make themselves the appendages or try to become close to the American ruling class. Instead, they tried to establish and understand the American people. And I think that's uh, the role that Asians in the West have. मैं इसमें इतना कहना चाहूँगा कि हमारा जो 75 साल का आजादी के बाद का इतिहास है, अगर इसको पूरे के पूरे को देखें, तो 60 वर्षों का इतिहास ऐसा है, जिसमें हम लोग अमेरिकन साम्राज्यवाद के शिकार रहे हैं, और हमने उसको भुगता है। अब की स्थितियाँ ऐसी हैं किन्हीं भी कारणों से। और कि हम हमारे देश को अमेरिकन रुझान पर हम चल रहे हैं और उनकी नीतियों पर हम प्रभावित हैं परंतु अगर जनता के स्तर पर देखें निचले स्तर पर देखें मैं एलिट्स की बात नहीं कर रहा मैं अगर निम्न स्तर पर देखो गांव के अंदर देखो किसान के बात बात करो खेत मजदूर के साथ बातचीत करो एक पूरा का पूरा आंदोलन चाहे हम उसको नक्सलवादी आंदोलन कह दें चाहे उसको माओइस्ट आंदोलन कह दें कोई उसका व्यापक प्रभाव है कोई छोटा ये नहीं है कि भाई कोई छोटे स्तर पर है कई राज्यों में तो बहुत बड़े स्तर पर है तो ये जो प्रभाव हैं ये स्वतः स्फूर्त हैं ये चीन की तरफ से नहीं आए कोई चीन ने हमें कोई यहाँ ऐसी ताकतों को नहीं भेजा घुसपैठ नहीं कि जिसकी वजह से आंदोलन बने ये जनता के स्वतः स्फूर्त आंदोलन है किसानों के खेत मजदूरों के 
और ये आंदोलन कोई लॉ एंड ऑर्डर की सिचुएशन नहीं है ये आंदोलन है राजनीतिक आंदोलन और जब हम इस राजनीतिक आंदोलन की बात करते हैं तो निश्चित रूप से हम उन आदर्शों के साथ घोल गालमेल करने की बात करते हैं उन आदर्शों के साथ जुड़ने की बात करते हैं कि जो कि साम्राज्यवाद के खिलाफ और समाजवाद के लोकतंत्र के पक्ष में खड़े हुए लोगों की बात करते हैं इसलिए मैं समझता हूं कि हमारे देश के अंदर करोड़ों लोग करोड़ों लोग जो कि वास्तव में जनता है नेहरू ने बार बार कहा भारत माता की जय और फिर सवाल किया हुई इज भारत माता भारत माता कौन है भारत माता को बहुत अच्छी तरह डिफाइन किया नेहरू ने और फिर उस डिफाइन करते हुए कहा कि ये भारत के लोग ये किसान ये मजदूर ये है भारत माता और मैं उन भारत माता की तरफ से कहना चाहूंगा कि उन लोगों के बीच उन लोगों के बीच चीन के प्रति चाहे हम कुछ ही कह लें चाहे एलिट्स की बात को ना कहें हम उन लोगों की बात ना कहें जो सत्ताधारी हैं उनके अपने इंटरेस्ट हो सकते होंगे पर अगर हम निम्न स्तर पर बात करें तो आज जैसे भास्कर जी ने कहा कि उनका संगठन काम कर रहा है बहुत अच्छी बात है पर ऐसे एक नहीं सैकड़ों संगठनों को खड़े करने की जरूरत है और जब ये संगठन खड़े होंगे तो ये जो प्रश्न है इनके उत्तर अपने आप में उतर जाएंगे और फिर ये जो स्थितियां भय की भ्रम की संदेहों की लड़ाई की और भटकाव की पैदा की हुई है इन सब स्थितियों से हम छुटकारा प्राप्त कर लेंगे राजू आई वुड लाइक टू से दैट इन 75 इयर्स आफ्टर इंडिपेंडेंस फॉर मेजर पार्ट ऑफ इट वी हैव बीन द विक्टिम्स ऑफ अमेरिकन इंपीरियलिज्म and even today we are influenced by american policy um and you know we are getting into uh into that camp but i would say that at the level of the people uh the peasantry there has actually been a huge influence uh, of uh, china and you know we can speak for example of what's called the naxal bari campaign or you know sometimes called maoist but these influences did not come um these were not imposed by china these were not china's uh, you know they developed independently um and uh, we have to uh, see what is positive in terms of uh, opposing imperialism and fighting for a, a, a socialist uh, society and uh, i think that uh, we have to talk about what the uh, what is you know nehru used to say Uh, bharat mata ki jai uh, and uh, he used to say but who is bharat mata who is india and he said that india he always said india is the peasantry india is the poor uh, india is the farmers and uh, these poor this peasantry uh, these are not under the influence um, you know they are much more likely to be influenced from china they are much more likely to have commonalities with china than they are to have the united states and uh, mr bhaskar mentioned his organization which is doing work for this kind of people to people contact uh, which is very good but i think thousands of such organizations have to come together um, among the people uh, and do this kind of work uh, i'll take one uh, last comment from facebook Uh, Jeremiah Kim says during the Korean War both India and China played crucial but distinct roles in pushing for peace Chinese volunteers sacrificed their lives to defend Korea from US imperialism and to prevent a third world war from decimating all of Asia India worked with the Soviet Union to achieve a peaceful settlement to the war under the condition of true self determination for the Korean people in addition to the reasons for peaceful coexistence between India and China i was wondering if the panelists could speak about the historic roles of India and China as bulwarks for peace in Asia and the world Meghna would you like to start Yeah I I can try I mean um well I I think this this is a discussion that I had in in the reading group 
uh, run by uh, Jeremiah and his colleagues, but about the, I mean, India's role in the non-aligned movement, and then you had China's role, um, especially I'm speaking about the beginning period, and they were very distinct, but they had this common goal of uh, peace. And I think even though, yes, China, I mean, China is a communist country, its experiments, um, its approach to solving problems, clearly there's a lot to learn from it. Um, but India's role in uh, really creating this framework for peaceful coexistence among countries, no matter what their uh, systems are, those are both very distinct but very important contributions for uh, mankind. So I think he raises a good point in talking about these two countries are different, but they both have so much to contribute to humanity. Um, and they both can and will uh, coexist peacefully. Um, yeah. Raju. Well, I can add that, yeah, I agree that they're both uh, with Meghna, that they're both, you know, and uh, I think, you know, in particular in that uh, period of the Korean War, you know, that's an important period to study and the role of India and China. And I think uh, Samoji mentioned the uh, first Indian ambassador to China, who was, uh, whose name was K.M. Panikar. And uh, he was, he actually saw not just the transition from the Kuomintang government to the government of the communists in China, which he wrote in his memoir, Into China's, uh, but he also in his memoir talked about the role of India in the Korean War. And, you know, this role was led by such personalities as himself, K.M. Panikar, Krishna Menon, um, uh, of course, Jawaharlal Nehru. And I think, uh, you know, it's really, uh, it was kind of a historic time when uh, how these people came together and conceptualized, you know, how they could contribute to the ending of the Korean War and in solidarity with the Korean people. Uh, and I think too little is known about it uh, and more has to be, you know, um, uh, we have to uh, discover more about how these figures and the roles they played. Uh, Dr. Montero. Yes. Um, I just like to make a brief comment in support of what Nandita said about uh, fighting against allowing the peace movement to be ideologically hollowed out. Peace is not pacifism. Peace is an active opposition to imperialist wars. And um, I like to contest uh, what I consider to be a wrong-headed um, uh, equivalency uh, that the global South is all the same in the imperialist uh, agenda. That is not true. Uh, first of all, every major US war over the last more than 75 years uh, have been fought in Asia. Uh, the Korean, and these have been genocidal wars. Uh, first of all, the dropping of two atomic weapons on Japan an Asian nation, uh, which would not have been done in Europe, of course. But then the Korean War, a genocidal war, a war against an entire people. The Vietnam War, a genocidal war against an entire people. The weapons that were used were not atomic weapons, but were as devastating. Uh, in the 21st century, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Let us not forget, even though imperialism defines Western Asia as the Middle East, uh, that's a colonial designation. In fact, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are part of Asia. Uh, uh, the only exception was the war in Libya. Uh, but every major war, and these have, again, been genocidal wars, have been in Asia. The buildup 
of nuclear and, and other weapons, naval and air forces in the um, uh, South China Sea, in the Taiwan Straits, is to contain an Asian nation, China. Uh, so I agree with Nundatha. We have to be ideologically clear on what the fight for peace is. And there cannot be a false equivalency of all of the global South, all of that part of humanity that was colonized or neo-colonized has a part to play in remaking humanity. However, Wherever you might be in the world, I'm, and I'm saying even in the United States, that the peace movement here cannot be ideologically um, uh, hollowed out. And it is Asia that is the target of Western imperialism and American imperialism. And this is why, you know, I agree, you know, Forgive me for saying this, I'm not trying to overstep my boundaries, but the westernized and American trained Indian elite are doing terrible damage to India by misrepresenting what democracy is in the United States, what the American people are suffering as a people terrible damage, they are apologists for US imperialism. And they're paid well, of course, you know, we cannot take that off of the table, uh, but they're doing, they're doing terrible damage to India. Uh, by the way, they are, uh, I think everybody knows this, they're very anti-Indian people. Uh, they choose to live and be like and talk like and behave like white American elites uh, and are often embarrassed by the Indian masses, but they're doing terrible damage to the people of the United States. So I think, um, uh, you know, I agree with, with Nandatha, I agree with everybody, that we cannot go forward in the fight for peace unless we take on those elites. In the case, of Afro-America, uh, the African-American misleadership class who have merged with the enemies of humanity uh, in, in supporting war in the name of democracy. So, yeah, I, you know, I am so much in favor of what Nandith has said. And, you know, my feeling is let's get it on you know, know the truth and let's not, let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not be, attempt to be on all sides, you know, of an issue. Let's not be guilty of ideological and political cowardice, stepping back when we need to step forward, you know? So I, that's my, I like to make that uh, contribution. Thank you, Dr. Montero. Um, I think we should uh, end because it's getting late. Uh, I'd just like to ask Nandita Raju to make some final comments uh, and then we can end after that. Well, Shantanu has his hand raised. We could take him as the last person. Yes, go ahead, Shantanu. Sorry about that. Um, Thank you to all the panelists for a wonderful presentation. Um, Mera prashna uh, Ram Mohan Rai ji ke liye hai. Um, and I, I will repeat my question in English. Uh, Ram Mohan Rai ji, in uh, 1962, when the war between Bharat and China was fought, the war between China and Bharat and China चीन के देशवासी ये बात भूल चुके हैं मेरा प्रश्न है कि आपके हिसाब से ये क्यों है कि हम भारतीय 
ये लड़ाई ये युद्ध को इतनी कड़वाहट से याद करते हैं पर चिन्ह ये बात भूल चुकी है सो माई क्वेश्चन टू राम मोहन राय जी इज दैट the the war of 1962 between india and china is remembered with a lot of bitterness by indians whereas uh, china has almost uh, ne- uh, nearly forgotten that we even went to war they have moved on with the with their own nation building but we still remember it with such bitterness and i wanted to ask him uh, in his opinion why that is why we hold on to it with such bitterness whereas china has moved on thank you shantanu ji aapne bilkul theek kaha par mera isme kehna ye hai ki ye jo ladai thi ye sirf hathiyaron ki ladai hui do deshon ki ladai hui aur khatam ho gayi itni nahi thi ye ladai vaicharik roop se bhi aaj tak ladi ja rahi hai humne 1965 ke andar pakistan se ladai ladi 1971 ke andar phir ladai ladi किसके हथियारों पर लड़ी पाकिस्तान के पास किसके हथियार थे पाकिस्तान के पास तो अमेरिका के हथियार थे इकहत्तर में सेवन फ्लीट जो भेजा वो किसने भेजा था पाकिस्तान के हक में हम पाकिस्तान के लोगों के साथ भी दोस्ती के साथ हैं पर मैं कहना चाहूं किसने भेजा था अमेरिका ने भेजा था तो हम उन्नीस को नहीं भूल गए हम उन्नीस को भूल गए ऐसा क्यों मेरा इसमें मानना साफ है कि लड़ाई वैचारिक है कि जो कम्युनिस्ट विरोधी और चीन विरोधी ताकते हैं वो इसको जिंदा रखना चाहती हैं अमेरिका को भुलवाना चाहती हैं इकहत्तर और उसके बाद के जितने घर हम हम भूल गए कि अमेरिका हमें कैसा गेहूं भेजता था हम भूल गए हम भूल गए सारी बातें हमें भूले नहीं हम, हमें भुला दी गई क्योंकि एक राजनीतिक लड़ाई है ये ये वैचारिक लड़ाई है और कुछ ताकतों का ये वेस्टर्न इंटरेस्ट है कि इस लड़ाई को हम हर समय ताजा रखें भारत के लोगों की जहां तक बात है मैं फिर वही कह रहा कहूंगा कि इस लड़ाई को कौन जारी रखा है मीडिया रखे हुए है जो सब भ्रांत लोग जिन्हें हम इलीट्स कहते हैं वो रखे हुए हैं क्या आम जो छोटे लोग हैं मैं फिर बार बार वही बात कह रहा हूं कि जो मजदूर है किसान है क्या वो भी रखे हुए हैं अगर ये बात होती तो आप देखें कि चीन का माल जो हिंदुस्तान के अंदर आ रहा है कौन लोग खरीद रहे हैं कितने लोगों ने कहा कि चीन के सामान का बहिष्कार कर दीजिए कहा ना अरे साल दो साल पहले कितने लोगों ने शोर मचाया बहिष्कार बहिष्कार हो गया क्या बहिष्कार नहीं हुआ ना तो इसलिए ये लड़ाई राजनीतिक है ये लड़ाई वैचारिक है और जब तक हम इस लड़ाई को इस स्तर पर भी नहीं लड़ेंगे जब तक ये जो भूलना और भुलाने वाली बात है ये नहीं होगी दूसरी बात मैं इसके साथ जुड़ी हुई कहना चाहूंगा मैं फिर बार बार कह रहा हूं मैं फिर पता नहीं क्यों मुझ में ये जज्बात आ रहे हैं या मेरे अंदर कोई दोष आ रहा है मैं बार बार कह रहा हूं मेरे को ये लगता है कि जो ये आपने बीड़ा उठाया है कमेटी बनाई है कमेटी फॉर फ्रेंडशिप और पीस एंड इन बिटवीन चाइना एंड इंडिया ये गिलहरी का काम करेगी हमने याद है ना गिलहरी ने क्या किया था कि भगवान राम जब सेतु बना रहे थे समुद्र पर तो कथानक आता है कि सब बड़े बड़े नल नील पत्थर फेंक रहे थे पर एक गिलहरी थी जो समुद्र में अपनी पूछ भिगोती थी फिर रीत में आकर अपनी पूछ को इधर उधर करती थी फिर समुद्र में जाकर उसको डुबो देती थी तो पूछा गया ये क्या कर रही है इसने कहा ये राम जो सेतु बन रहा है उसमें मदद कर रही है ये भी अपना ऐतिहासिक रोल खत्म नहीं करना चाहती तो जब ऐसे संगठन खड़े हों ऐसे लोग खड़े हों जनता भूल चुकी है पर जो निहित स्वार्थी लोग हैं वो याद उनकी राजनीति यही है उनकी राजनीति यही है इस रूप में मैंने कहा शायद मैं अपनी बात को कहने में मैंने प्रयास किया है पर प्रयास ही है ये और मैं मेरी जहां तक समझ है ये यथार्थ भी है धन्यवाद शुक्रिया राम मोहन जी
um, hey, thank, <laughs> thank you very much. I think this was an important point, uh, and I'll just briefly translate that uh, because you know we didn't cover it today, and I think it's very important that Shantanu you brought it up in the reply. Um, Ramon Raiji said that uh, you are right that uh, you know about the fact that we are remembering the war between India and China in '62. But we have to remember, this is not simply a question of a fight that happened, uh, you know, with, with guns and whatever, and, you know, and it got over. But this is the primary question is ideological. And uh, we also had other wars. In 65, we had a war with Pakistan. In 71, you know, the liberation of Bangladesh was a war with Pakistan. Um, and who was the one who armed Pakistan? Uh, who was the one who sent the seventh fleet, you know, during the liberation of Bangladesh? Um, it was the United States. And uh, the fact that we have forgotten that fact, we have forgotten the role of the United States, but the 62 war is being brought up again and again, um, is because this is not a question of the war, it's an ideological question. And there are those with vested interests who keep bringing this up. And these are uh, you know, and I'm repeating myself, these are among the media, these are among the elites, not among the people. The people are not, people don't remember that war like that. Um, and, you know, uh, last year or last two years, there are many calls to boycott China. Uh, but who, um, and who said this, and this was not uh, something that uh, uh, among the people, it's, I mean, this is impossible. In fact, even today, actually, he didn't, Ramonji didn't say this, but I'll just add that the trade between India and China continues to rise, it has crossed a hundred billion dollars. Uh, but anyway, sorry to continue, he said that this is an ideological fight. And I'm saying again and again that uh, this committee um, of friendship between Indian and Chinese people, uh, this is like a, uh, you know, this is like a, a squirrel. And, you know, in Indian mythology, when uh, the god Ram, he was, uh, building the Ram Setu bridge uh, across from here to um, uh, he at that time there were many things that were happening and huge efforts to construct the bridge but alongside that there was also a squirrel who was again and again going to the water coming back to the shore and that squirrel was also contributing to the construction of the bridge contributing to its uh, uh, to this historic task and you know, and so this is a metaphor to say that this committee may be playing a small role at this point, but it's engaged in a historic task, uh, and a very important uh, historic task. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all I have in my notes. But I did want to add that uh, you know, and it's important. I think, uh, and we haven't fully gotten to this yet today, uh, to understand the role, the way in which China has changed. Uh, because it has to be admitted at that time, China also played a negative role. For example, during the 71 war, uh, you know, by supporting Pakistan, by not supporting the liberation of Bangladesh. Um, and, you know, there are other instances one can uh, um, point out. But uh, the fact of the matter is that this is not the China today is not the China um, of 71. And we have to understand and appreciate that. And that can only happen if we study China. You know, if we hold on to, um, uh, you know, hold on to conceptualizations that maybe made sense in uh, 1970, then that won't help us understand what's happening right now and what we need to do today. Uh, and I think that's a very important uh, uh, task for our time. I thought I'd just add that. Maybe I'll just make a concluding announcement uh, that uh, uh, we are going to continue this conversation in our final event next week. Uh, it will be at the same time, uh, 8.30 a.m. In, in Philadelphia and 6 p.m. on Sunday uh, in India. And uh, that will be a panel on the changing world order and the rise of China and the role that India has to play in the future. And our panelists will be uh, Sudhindra Kulkarni, who is a journalist in India, and uh, Martin Jacques, who is a well-known uh, scholar who, who writes, uh, and they both, they both have consistently spoken on China uh, and for positive relations between India and China. And um, uh, just to conclude, I would like to say that um, 
you know, this is not, uh, that our efforts to build this peace between India and China um, um, are, are purposeful or, you know, they're, they're directed because, uh, um, you know, in this time, India and China represent uh, the majority of humankind, you know, which is submerged by poverty. And Martin Jack points it out when he says that by 2050, the Chinese economy will have surpassed the American economy and the Indian economy will be the same size as the American economy, if not larger. And so, and this will be the first time in about 300 years where the dominant, the two dominant economies in the world will be Asian and not Western. And so to build peace, in Asia is the imperative task that we face today. Uh, and you know, this may, this may form the basis for a new world order, which can be just and peaceful. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody who came out. Uh, thanks to Purba for moderating and everybody who spoke. Thank you, Ramonji. Um, and maybe we can stop the live stream now.